spoke with Mike earlier today, and uh, we both agreed that uh, to get the most out of tonight, we will encourage lots of questions from the floor. So, um, so please ensure um, that uh, you utilize uh, the Q and A session towards the uh, the end of the uh, end of the evening. Now, our leaders' lecture series have uh, been hugely popular across Australia, and I'm now proud to say that we run these leaders' lecture series across four countries as part of the 60 events that we do um, every year. As many of you are also aware, on top of the event side of our business, ABNF uh, produce a daily online newsletter and a monthly magazine. So I encourage all of you to grab a copy. There's some at reception and on your seats today, uh, and sign up for a trial of our uh, daily online if you're not already getting it. Now, tonight's event would not have been possible without the input and support from tonight's sponsor, IBM. Thank you very much. The continuous support uh, of our long-term uh, term partner, Randstad, as well as these fine, brand new facilities here at Allen's. So please join me in thanking those three organizations for the support. Now, um, to kick things off, I'd like to uh, welcome Paul Zoch, the General Manager of Randstad Source Right Australia, to open up. Paul. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you all here to the ABNF Randstad Leaders Lecture this evening. Um, Randstad is immensely proud of our association with this particular series of lectures. We've been partnering with ABNF since 2010 and uh, this particular <coughs> Leaders Lecture Series since 2011. <coughs> the lecture series gives all of us the opportunity to come together, share insights and business content and network with key business leaders in the bank and finance sector, all obviously with the aim of contributing to the industry. Tonight we'll reflect on back to basics and beyond in the banking sector. And given the current level of global uncertainty, I think this is a particularly timely topic. I firmly believe that it's not just the focus for your industry, but many industries right now, in that they must go back to basics. For Randstad, going back to basics is all about providing the best possible recruitment and HR consulting services and ensuring we make the perfect match. Matching people with companies that will develop their potential and matching companies with people that will take their business to the next level. We're very passionate about this and we work very hard with our clients to understand their business needs and the challenges that they face today. And definitely what we're hearing is one of those challenges is access to talent at all levels um, to meet demand of growth and the challenging environments going forward. One way of securing the best people we believe in the race for talent is to develop a strong employer brand. Now some of you may be aware and most of you may not, but recently we held the 2012 Randstad Awards <laughs> which is a global research project on employer branding commemorating the recognition of the most attractive employers in each country. Here in Australia, 7,000 people were surveyed regarding their perceptions of the country's 150 largest employers, many of which were banking financial services institutions. The results provided us with a precise picture of the factors people regard as most important when choosing a company to work for. When we drill down specifically to the banking and finance sector, the research tells us that 33% of people working in your industry surveyed rated career progression opportunity as the most important factor to consider when working for a company. This is one of many elements which could help financial services institutions and banks to build an attractive employer brand while planning to recruit new profiles and attract the talent they need going forward in the next stage of business. In an ever-changing world, the concept of employer branding is becoming increasingly important and smart businesses are catching on fast and reaping the benefits. The focus can help you bring recruitment back to basics and meet the challenge of attracting the interest and attention of the market's most talented people. Thanks again for the opportunity to introduce here, Tyler, and I look forward to tonight's presentation. Thank you very much, Paul. And thank you, Mr. Randstad. Now, to introduce our guest speaker, I'd like to call upon Doug Park from IBM. Doug is the Financial Services Industry Solutions Executive, and special thanks to IBM for once again um, sponsoring one of these lectures. Doug. Thank you, Tyler, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to start by thanking um, the Australian Banking and Finance um, Organisation, Randstad and um, Allens for um, hosting this event, creating this event. I think it's, uh, these sort of events are an important opportunity for us um, as industry participants and peers to network and ex share and exchange ideas, and I um, look forward to being um, a further part of those sorts of activities. Um, I would also like to thank um, Australian Bank of Finance for the opportunity to sponsor this event. Um, I represent uh, uh, my uh, General Manager of Financial Services, um, Brett Vincent, who can't be here tonight, but um, Brett is very keen to keep 
are uh, investing in these sorts of events um, for, for the benefit of not only ourselves from a commercial point of view, but also from an industry point of view in terms of participation. Um, we're a major, as you would know, we're a major supplier of the capability of the financial services worldwide. Um, I'd just like to draw your attention to some complimentary copies of our CEO survey. This is a biannual event we run around the world, around 1,700 CEOs. Um, Mike has actually participated in, in previous versions of that, and we're just uh, mobilising for the 2012 one. Um, I think you may find that um, some of the findings and observations in that report um, will help amplify some of the things I think Mike might be talking about tonight. So I do ask um, if you would like to help yourself to those. We, we've made some copies available. <coughs> um, and if you are interested in getting information on the 2012 survey, which, as I said, we will be starting shortly, um, please either let myself know or anybody from the room from IBM and we can um, we can make sure that when that's published later this year, because we're just doing the data capture at the moment, that um, we'll let you know when that's available. Um, I don't believe, and you will agree with me, Mike Hurst and Benny Bean need any introduction from me. Um, I also have the privilege of being Mike's client uh, manager for the IBM relationship um, and um, the Bendigo model resonates with me um, both in terms of my professional role in, in assisting the bank, but also as a, as a consumer. Um, so I um, find it very easy to identify and, and try and um, add value in, in terms of the bank's operations. But all of you will know that in terms of customer stat and um, other metrics in terms of you know, um, customer interaction, Bendigo's results have been ones that other organisations have aspired to for many, many years, um, and not just in the banking sector. And I think uh, in a world and, and, and in a world in sort of dominated by complexity, it sort of remains Australia's only true community-based banking franchise. And that intersection between that community um, orientation and the move towards mobility and connectedness, I think, provides some new challenges for financial organisations, new entrants, new competition, um, but new opportunities. And I think uh, Bendigo is uniquely positioned with its banking and telco assets to respond to those challenges and I'm sure um, Mike will, will speak to those points in his address. So without any further ado, would you please join me in welcoming Mike Hurst to the podium for his, his address. Thank you. Thanks Doug. Um, a bit like Cherish, there's some seats here in the front of you for those <laughs> up the back if they want to take them up. I think uh, it's terrific to see so many people here tonight on what's a pretty ordinary night. Um, perhaps it's just all those fees on paying Alan's that are paying off, I don't know. Um, this evening I'd like to uh, talk to you about my thoughts on what the future might hold for banks and what I think will be very important if banks are going to be successful in what's going to be a very uh, fast moving and challenging world and, and Doug's touched on mobility and, and what that's going to mean and how replicable that is and how easy it is to enter into banking these days. So in that sort of environment, what are the things that are going to be important? Now, first off, if I can just ask for a show of hands, how many people here have smartphones? So that's not how many smart people, but how many <laughs> people with smartphones? And how many of you have done banking on your smartphone? Fair work. Uh, how many of you have got the CBA app Kachin? <coughs> Kachunk. <laughs> <laughs> um, now look, that, that, that last couple of questions, that was just a little bit of cheap market research on my part. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is a serious question. How many would actually move banks for functionality in apps? Yeah, yeah that's, that's kind of what I thought. So, Given the demographic in this room, I'm not sure you guys are necessarily representative uh, of the population of the Although if I asked how many people with my headset smartphones, there'd be four hands go up. And if I asked how many knew how to use them, only one would. And it's not me. Um, but what I do know is that there's a real appetite in banking and consumer research and the markets that's driving significant spend on technology and in particular in mobile technology to the point where the emphasis on this discussion that you see in the market and especially through um, strategy releases and, and releases to the stock exchange 
that suggests that technology and particularly mobile innovation spend is going to determine which banks will be successful in the future and which will flounder. And I really struggle with that concept, to tell you the truth, and, and that little bit of research we just did there perhaps says that I'm not on my own. So let me explain sort of in a roundabout way why I think that's the case. I'm sure we all understand the idea of events defining times in our lives or in our careers. You know, the sort of thing, where were you when this happened? Where were you when Geelong won the flag in 07, 09, 11? <laughs> <laughs> and there's no doubt that the global financial crisis is going to be one of those events for everyone who's been involved in finance for the last five years. For those who began work post 2000, it's the event that brought an end to a long period of credit growth, strong returns for financial firms, and even stronger returns for staff and management. For those who've begun work post-2007, the GFC is a fantastic university. Now, I've got some people who work for me who've only started during this period, and I say to them all the time, you guys want to soak up everything that's happening here because you're seeing so much about the technical application of banking in a really tough environment, and the things that, that you'll learn in this three or four year period, it's taken a lot of people 30 years to learn. To learn. And for those who, like me, began prior to 1985, which was really when deregulation in the Australian economy and, and banking came to be in Australia, I think the GFCs provided a timely reminder as to why banks were formed in the first place. And deviating from that true purpose that banks had has put us in dire circumstances, not just with the GFC, but also in terms of the future of banks and the competition for banks. So if I can just spend a little bit of time talking about the privileged, privileged role that banks have in the economy, be that at the broader or at the local level. The only book that I have on banking, and I dare say there's probably not been that many written, it's not the world's greatest subject, <laughs> Uh, is The Theory and History of Banking by Charles F. Dunbar. And although that book was written in 1909, it has some insights that I think remain very relevant today. In it, he outlines that the role of a bank is to intermediate between those with more funds and opportunity and those in the opposite position. And that what we know today as payment systems has always been and will always remain an important field of banking activities but that it's not the core. Importantly though, he identifies, and I'll quote him, that some agency for lending and some place of deposit are called for as soon as commerce begins to move in a regular course, <coughs> noting that these functions require prudence, integrity and patience. And in my view, that analysis goes to the very genesis of banking and it lies in the notion that everyone should benefit from a financial transaction. The investor who provides the funds, the borrower, the bank shareholders who bear the risk of the borrower not paying, and society itself. Banks were formed to feed into prosperity this way, to accept cash from savers, to lend to borrowers who could add value to it. The bank charged the borrower a bit more than it paid the investor, and return the risk margin to its shareholders as dividends. The value added along the way was invariably beneficial to society. People gained employment, houses were built, businesses started and public infrastructure funded. Much of this philosophy, philosophy has been lost over the last few decades. With the balance of value shared between all stakeholders in banks, the shareholders, management, staff, partners, and communities, including the government, has shifted in favour of the former few at the expense of the latter majority. Take, for example, the exorbitant, exorbitant bonuses that have been paid at Wall Street and in London. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's get a bit ahead of myself there. <laughs> And also, I would argue, the high levels of, of return on equity that banks have been earning over the last 10 to 15 years. 
Both of those are evidence of excessive value flowing to one stakeholder group at the expense of the others. Harvard economic luminaries Michael Porter and Mark Kramer argue that getting the share of value correct is paramount for the sustainability of companies. They say that in recent times, companies are widely perceived to be prospering at the expense of the broader community. And the community certainly underlines this view in respect of banks. Further, they believe short-term profit objectives blind firms to the need to nurture long-term health of the markets from which they draw their revenues and conclude that businesses must reconnect company success with social progress. Shared value is not social responsibility, philanthropy or even sustainability, but a new way to achieve economic success. It is not on the margin of what companies do, but at the centre. They believe that it can give rise to the next major transformation of business thinking. My view is that in the case of banks, they're just outlining a return to what banks were created in the first place. Feeding into prosperity and not often. Put simply, it's very difficult to run a successful business in a poor community. To my mind, this is the true purpose of banks. It engenders the community trust to provide banks with a license to operate, something that will be hugely important in the not too distant future. And that brings me to the issue of banks and the future. It's relatively easy to mount a case that this trusted role that banks have always had in the economy is under threat from new entrants, something that would have been unthinkable even just a few years ago. And that was because it was very difficult for organisations to break into banking because of the high barriers to entry. High cost of technology, high cost of licensing, high cost of compliance and capital. But I think there's four fundamental reasons why this threat exists today, and those reasons provide a platform for a myriad of potential areas of attack. Firstly, there is now some degree of mistrust in banks globally. In most countries in the world, if you inquired of the general public as to what they thought of banks generically, the response would be overwhelmingly negative. Customer satisfaction is usually only average, and politicians and the media have banks at the top of their hiss list. And we know this here in Australia because every time the Reserve Bank changes rates, even though the nexus between the Reserve Bank cash rate and the home loan rate is somewhat distance, distant these days, the media, the government, everybody comes out and bags the banks. Now that doesn't just happen because uh, they've decided to do it. You know, banks have earned that bagging over the last 20 or 30 years with the way that they've gone about their business and the way that we've moved away from that true purpose of banking. And effectively that opens the door for new competitors to come in. Secondly, the response of governments and regulators to the GFC means new and more regulation is now an everyday burden for banks. Whether it's in the guise of prudential regulation, tax compliance or consumer protection, regulation is providing an ever-increasing financial burden. And I'm not saying that it's not deserved or necessary. I am saying, though, that it could well play a role in threatening the position of banks in the economy, as new entrants establish operations outside the traditional bank environments and avoid this burden. Thirdly, because banks are so fundamental to economies, they're inextricably tied to the economic cycle. As a result, most of the time there'll be some sort of cross-subsidy within any bank's business as the economic cycle benefits one silo over another. Monoline product providers, attracted by the opportunity to explore the surplus business unit profits, will impact to some degree on the bank's ability to take the long-run view. And the most obvious example of this is what mortgage originators did during the 90s, where there was a significant subsidy going from home loans into business loans and other operations that banks had, to the point that John Simon and others identified that the risk that was being charged on uh, more home loans contained a very uh, excessive premium that was actually being used elsewhere in the bank. So they came into the market as a monoline producer cut the margins savagely 
in that area and banks went from having home loan margins of 4% to 2%. As a result, they introduced um, fees that we so often hear about today and those fees, I think, weren't a bad response to what was required because it moved banking from a clearly subsidised business into a much more of a user pays business. But it can't be like that the whole time because of the way the economic cycle works. Finally, technology, which as I said earlier was once a huge barrier to entry in banking, is actually now an enabler. Reductions in cost, uh, adoptions by consumers of smartphone technology and open systems architecture are combining to spur new entrants. And we can most easily see this in the area of payments where PayPal and Google are making huge strides. Also in ATM networks and in the new capital light banking models of Movement Bank and Bank Simple. These are serious competitors. Take Google for instance. As many of you would know, Google's business model is built around data that captures and analyses people, people's behaviour. 95% of their revenue, which is about 30 million you pretty big in US dollars comes from advertising and they're increasingly able to effectively target this by understanding what it is that interests each individual. My understanding of their driving force around Google Wallet is that they want to be able to target specific <coughs> offers to individuals in real time. For example, if you happen to own a smartphone and you've been searching for, say, fashion, boy, you've been doing that, I've got no idea, through a Google site, then they will capture this information and when you pass a fashion store that Google have as a customer, they'll send you a discount coupon for that store on your smartphone. If you use that coupon by buying something in that store, you can then pay via your smartphone. So clearly for Google, that means that they're involved in the traditional advertising business, the payments business, and I think potentially where they're headed is in the business of deposit transaction accounts and picking up the float on those low cost deposits. PayPal on the other hand are tackling the issue slightly differently and are looking to develop a role in the payment systems themselves and, and in fact I think I'm right in, in saying that they're actually licensed uh, by APRA here in Australia for the operations that they carry out down here. They're a very innovative company, understand their business well and have plenty of cash so to ignore them would be foolish. And last year, um, I went on an investor road show to uh, New York and Boston, uh, and on the way over the CFO and I went to uh, Silicon Valley to visit both Google and PayPal, and it is just amazing. Hey, it's amazing what the buildings in that look like. But it's amazing how much food they give everyone. <laughs> And see, so it's amazing just the attitude and the approach that, that, that they're taking to do business. But I guess none of this is really a surprise. There's been a lot of people who've been saying for a long time that there'll be convergence between banking, telecommunications and payments. As far as I know, no one's been able to clearly articulate how that might work, although at Bendigo and Adelaide Bank, we've invested in a company called Hub IT, which has uh, an app called NoQ, uh, which is currently live in Adelaide and is now coming to uh, Victoria, that enables you to um, order off your smartphone in advance for food and beverage, receive back a time to pick up what you need, make the payment so that you just walk into the coffee store, your coffee's waiting there and you head off. Or, you know, it could be used at the football if you wanted to, uh, you know, a couple of beers and, and normally I'll have two pies and a few dim sims. <laughs> and you can pay for it, they'll tell you what area to go to pick it up, there'll be a queue there, you just walk through, show them your receipt on the phone and away you go. All those four things I think are combining to really pose a challenge to banks going forward and the environment itself is only going to compound that problem because of two other issues. The first is that banks' returns are falling. So we've gone from earning the 22 and 23% ROEs, which in my view were too high, to the, the 15 and the 16 and the 17% uh, 
as more capital and more liquidity are required to be held on bank balance sheets. So that in itself makes it difficult for banks to invest a lot to be able to challenge. Secondly though, and I see this happening at, at my house all the time, consumers today are being educated that online equals cheap. And so the more you go online, the more the value proposition that's being offered to you is price. And we all know that price is a race to the bottom. So if these new competitors come in in an online world and challenge the banks and the banks respond, today it has to happen on price. But what other options might banks have to respond? Well, they can become more capital efficient, they can take on more risk to boost their earnings, cut costs, shrink balance sheets, invest in new front end systems that are low cost, and I think this is the most likely outcome, or they can do a combination of all of those things. But no matter what combination of solutions banks select, there's one thing that they all must do to ensure that they survive, and that is return to the trust that communities want to have in their financial institutions. That is what Dunbar tells us banks were formed for, and the role that I think they must play if they are to avoid accepting the lowest price as a strategy. Of course, I can't speak for any bank but Bendigo and Adelaide Bank in terms of how this can be done. But from our perspective, it's something that's fundamental to the way we do business. And the starting point for us is quite logical. What obligation does the board, management and staff have in running our company? And who are the stakeholders that we need to consider in the context of that? Benny on Adelaide Bank is 154 years old, and I think we demonstrate, most obviously through our community bank model, that we understand the important and privileged role banks play in the economy. We also understand that with privilege comes obligation, and I hope you would agree that we actively try and meet that requirement. Doing that draws a great sense of stewardship for the organisation from our board and staff, and that is supported by the values that underpin our culture. And we recently completed our customer engagement, uh, our staff engagement survey, and 96% of our staff are committed to our strategy and our vision and values. 77% of them would recommend Bendigo and Adelaide Bank as a place, a great place to work for their friends and family. So that motivation that drives through our bank, the one that I think picks up Dunbar's historical view of why banks were formed, is a very strong enabler for our organisation. I think importantly our vision and strategy guides us clearly in meeting the community's expectations. Our aim to be Australia's leading customer connected bank is driven by understanding our success comes from focusing on the success of all our stakeholders, our customers, our people, partners and communities, feeding into prosperity and not off it. Uniquely, I think, our strategy says we will take a 100 year view of the business. We will listen and we will partner for sustainable long term outcomes. Our organisational and decision frameworks reflect the fact that we must consider all our stakeholders and the balance in the value that they receive from our business. Whilst we realise that from time to time, the balance may get out of whack, and we've seen that with the cost of funds and the price of, of loans, meaning that customers are probably benefiting, although I don't think any of them would believe it, but <laughs> they're, they're benefiting at, at the expense of our partners and shareholders at the moment. We have to make sure that we work that back into some sort of sync where everybody thinks they're getting the right amount of value from the organisation. Because if we don't, one of them will withdraw and then we'll be left without a key plank in what it is that we're trying to achieve. Drawing all, drawing all this to a conclusion, I think that the challenges banks face in the future are best tackled by learning from the past. If banks are to repel new competitors, and there will be many, then regaining and keeping community trust by feeding into prosperity is a great place to start. So thank you for coming tonight. I'd like to thank 
Uh, AP, Asia Pacific Banking and Finance, I, I've always known as Australian Banking and Finance, I've looked on the website at a change. <laughs> I've gone with the uh, A, B and F. Uh, and Randstad for asking me to talk this evening. Thank you very much to IBM for sponsoring and Alan's for hosting. I'm particularly pleased that the sponsor and the host are among partners of Bendigo Bank that we regard, we regard highly. Um, I'd also like to thank you all for attending tonight. As I said earlier, it's uh, not the greatest night out there. Um, I was lucky enough to get a car park downstairs. I'm not sure you all did. <laughs> I'd like to uh, finish it there and uh, I'm more than happy to, take, to try and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. But uh, we do have this nifty looking little lapel mic that we can use for our, uh, our Q&A. Now if you've got any questions, um, please hold your hand up while we walk around. I might tell, oh, we've got plenty. Okay, I'm going to have to kick us off. Fantastic. Hi, <laughs> Mike. This is Kelly from SAS. Uh, go Cats. Um, just curious, who's your current uh, largest competitor in the marketplace? You mentioned new entrants, etc. Is it an existing or a new entrant that should be this fear at the moment? Uh, well, we get asked this question a lot actually about you know, who we think our competitors are and who we're against. And I think the most logical answer, but, but probably uh, the most tried, is it's the major banks. I mean, they've got. 90% of the market or 85 depending on, on what you read. So every time we're trying to attract a new customer, nine out of 10 times, it's going to be trying to attract them away from one of the major banks. So whilst um, a lot of people would say, well, our major competitors, Bank of Queensland or Suncorp or Building Society Credit Unions, we don't see it that way. We actually see that the major competitors, the major competitors for us are the major. Uh, Mike, uh, Peter Ray from Morningstar. Um, you spoke a lot about returns um, and returns on equity being too high um, and having come down. Then you go in Adelaide, earnings are at return on equity of around 8%, roughly, which is about half uh, what your major uh, bank competitors are earning. Um, just wondering how, what you think about that, whether you think that that's too low or whether major bank returns are still too high. And if you do think it's too low, uh, second part of the question is, how do you go about lifting that? Um, do you think that there's a, a need for consolidation among smaller players within the industry, uh, given that the challenging um, conditions confronted the time? Well, I think the first thing to say is that you've got to compare apples to apples. So our ROE is heavily weighed down by the goodwill of the merger with Adelaide Bank, and the, whereas the major banks don't carry a lot of goodwill. So. The, the right number for us to focus on, I think, is return on tangible equity. So what's the return on the next dollar that we invest and what does that look like? And the ROT for us is about 13.5%. So we're, we're probably about 3 or 4% below where the major banks are on a like-for-like -like basis. Um, clearly, the way that you lift that is continue to do uh, what you can very well. And our, we, we have a very different service proposition to everybody else. We have a very different value proposition in terms of um, community engagement, engagement with our customers. We have uh, grown in the last 12 months, second only to the NAB. Um, the NAB have a very aggressive strategy out there at the moment. And we're still working on the same strategy that we've had for 154 years in terms of engagement with customers and community. The big challenge for us, I think, relative to the others, is the amount of businesses that they have that are not capital intensive. So we don't have a significant wealth business, uh, as all the majors do. We don't have significant corporate finance trading businesses that don't have a lot of capital or a lot of expense. When you, uh, and, and the only way that I know is publicly available to compare our performance to the majors is if you look at the cost to income ratio of the retail divisions of the major banks 
it's currently sitting around 50 to 52 percent we're at about 56 or 57 so we've still got to get more efficient um, we are looking to see what we what we have embarked on a um, move to the advanced accreditation model which we think will make us a more robust business uh, in terms of our risk management frameworks but it will also give us um, a, an opportunity to be a lot more capital efficient so uh, they're probably the key things that we need to focus on how do we get that ROA up um, and how that goes through <coughs> Uh, hi, Mike. Uh, this is Avi from Emphasis. Uh, you touched upon technology. Uh, uh, I just have a question around Plan B, uh, which was one of the early initiatives by Bendigo around social collaboration. Uh, just want to understand what are some of the lessons that you've learned of that and how do you relate it to the future of uh, the banking now? Yep. So, Plan B is a, a site that we launched probably uh, two years ago, which what it tries to do is it brings together people who have a plan that they want to achieve but don't have the expertise to be able to do it. So, for instance, there was a lady in Western Australia who wanted to have a um, children's playground in her local neighbourhood, didn't really know much more about it than that. So she went on to plan big, um, a town planner came in and helped her with an application to put towards a council, a designer came in and helped her design it. Um, other people came in with support, etc., and she was able to achieve that plan and get that uh, playground built. And in fact, as a result of that, she's now on the local council, and she's now also on the board of the local community bank. So she's really used it well. Um, there, uh, there's, if you go and have a look at the site, there's a whole lot of people up there that are trying to achieve things, seeking out others who might be able to help them. Um, so it's, a, it's based on our community bank model in a way it's a collaborative engagement vehicle in a virtual world. Uh, when we launched it uh, two years ago the most common question around the executive was well look this is great but how do we actually monetize it? Um, I'm still not sure we know but it, it really has uh, hit a spot with a lot of, we're getting a lot of customers out of it I suppose and it's really hit a spot with our staff, it's given us a, a presence in social media and I think from that point of view it was very much a, you know, foot in the water from our end and who knows where it could end up, it, it could well end up being um, a virtual community bank uh, for us going forward but we're, we're still doing a bit of sucking to see really. Billy Tarrant from UBS. Um, I was quite interested in your comment, uh, which we hear quite frequently, is that back in the old days, the banks used to be a lot more popular, and these days everybody seems to hate their own, their own bank. Um, obviously, you and, and IAG and a few others are, are the popular ones relative to the, to, the, to the major banks. But I mean, you sort of read in the history books, the money lender was always the one that everybody hated. Um, and, and obviously dislike for, for obvious reasons. Uh, do you really think that 20 years ago it was, it was that different to what it is today? Well, I've got a little bit of advantage in you being able to answer this question because you look like you're about 25. <laughs> 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 and, and yes, I do. <coughs> when I joined a bank, uh, which was 1979, down on the corner of Collins and King, um, and it wasn't in a building that's there today. Um, it was very much about community. You know, the, the money lender example that you've given, I think, is more in the context of the usury type money lender. Um, certainly, in all the communities that I grew up in, the bank manager was one of the most respected people in the town. He was a leader within the town. He was someone that people went to for counsel. Uh, generally, he was involved in a lot of the community operations within that town, helping develop and build it. So, um, you know, banks <coughs> do get a bit of a bad rap from time to time. But at the end of the day, and you know, just have a look here in Australia, have a look at how fantastic our payment systems are, have a look at the, the electronic networks, the branch networks, all of the enablers that, that banks have invested in to uh, help the community develop and, and move along. So I absolutely believe 
that banks are fundamental in economies in making sure that economies grow and develop. Uh, Mike, right now, I have a question for you in terms of funding diversification. Uh, we've seen all the four majors go and uh, issue cover bonds to tap different investor bases, such as the, the German pension funds and the like. Is that something you'd envisage doing, or is the, the level of, of over collateralisation to get to AAA on a cover bond pool prohibitive for someone like Indigo? Or, or other factors that, that are prohibitive? Yeah. Um, I think the first thing to say is that we want our funding mix to sit around 80% deposits, 20% wholesale funding. Um, and there's no doubt that that has stood us in really good stead over the last five years. So we were the only bank in Australia that didn't use the government guarantee for wholesale funding. Um, where, well, up until the Bank of Queensland got upgraded after they got downgraded, we were one of the few banks in the world to receive an upgrading. We credit rating upgrade and we received two last year. And a lot of that goes to the strength of our balance sheet because of, the, of what we have with deposits. I think I've been um, involved in funding one way or another for about, I don't know, shit, 25 years. <laughs> I think I might retire. Um, <laughs> and the, the, uh, the perception over that time has been that it's always been harder for anyone but the major banks to get uh, funding and they have to pay more for it, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And up until the GFC, that was absolutely the case. And um, the amount of wholesale funding that was available to the major banks meant that you know, a lot of their deposit ratios stood at around 50% because it was actually cheaper to go and get wholesale funding. And there's no shame in that or there's nothing wrong with that because Australia's always been an economy that's needed to import capital because it's been growing. And because we have got such an efficient banking system that the majority of that's always been done through the banks. And we haven't had a well-developed fixed interest market um, for those reasons. The interesting thing to come out of the GFC, and I think a bit of a perception that's held in the market today, which I've been slowly addressing, uh, although my shareholders might want me to address it a bit quicker, is that we now raise funds at exactly the same rate as the major banks. So the major banks are roughly seeing deposits and wholesale funding, be it covered bonds or senior unsecured, as fungible depending on where the price is. They've, they've got a, an absolute um, preference for deposits, but the price across both those markets is about exactly the same. In the retail deposit, <coughs> there is no differentiation on credit rating or on size. Everybody competes within, say, 10 or 20 basis points of each other. So our cost of funds relative to the major's cost of funds is as close as it has ever been. So I don't see a need to um, go out and raise cover bonds. We're still growing our retail deposits very strongly. I think everyone knows that the savings rate in Australia has gone from 4 or 5% up to about 11 or 12% over the last three or four years. That means that there's a hell of a lot of deposits flowing in the banks. One of the best things that we've ever done, not just from a funding point of view, but also from the point of view of our total business, is open 288 community banks in the last 10 years. You know, they are fantastic for gathering deposits and for deposits that are very sticky. So I don't uh, feel any disadvantage at all on the funding front. Um, I feel, you know, especially since I couldn't get tickets to the Olympics, there's no point in going overseas to see overseas investors around raising covered bonds. Um, so I, I'm very comfortable with our position. I think the market, once the market starts to understand what the pricing differential is, then you know, we're going to find ourselves in a pretty good position. Hi, Mike. Simon Hill from uh, Artica. Um, Bandico Bank's been really good at building community, community spirit, and getting closer to your customers. How do you balance that with technology, which typically is moving you away from your customers? Yeah, that, and and that's a, uh, you know, I guess that gets to the nub of, of what I've been saying today. That, um, you know, it was interesting that when I asked how many people would move banks because of app functionality. I think three people put their hands up. 
Um, the thing about technology is that it's getting cheaper and cheaper all the time. On that basis, it's much more easy to replicate it in a very short period of time. So where it was once a huge competitive advantage, that competitive advantage, I think, is disappearing as we go ahead. You know, we've, we've got a, an area called customer-led connections that we've established, which is really about building front-end systems in the digital world and seeing what we can do in that space. And, and you know, no queue is part of that. And the approach we're taking to it is that we will try lots of things. We've got the view that all the stuff we do will be disposable. You know, if it doesn't work, we just throw it away because it's that cheap to redo it and move on. So I don't think that there's going to be a huge connection with customers through technology. Yes, you'll have to have it. Yes, you'll have to be good at it. The functionality will have to be um, such that people are satisfied with it. But why are people going to bank with you rather than someone else when they can push any bank's name on the screen? You know, there's got to be some other connection than that to get people to bank with you. It's got to be trust. It's got to be that they see that you're doing the right thing by them in their community. It's got to be seen that you're trying to balance the outcome of your business across all your stakeholders in a fair and equitable way. And I think if you can do that, then your ability to succeed in what's going to be a pretty competitive world driven by technology is far better than just hanging your hat on, we're going to be the fastest one with the next app, the best functionality. Good day, Mike. Stuart Sharman from First Data. Um, I might point out as well that um, in the football, there's a game starting in 30 minutes, so we'll see how the win runs. Well, oh, we would have liked to have seen that last Friday, but we didn't. Anyway, we can talk about it at length. But um, my, my question is somewhat related to the question that Simon asked in, re in relation to the role that innovation can potentially play in, in the, in the um, industry. But, but particularly, you sort of answered the question to Simon, but the RBA released a paper was a week, week and a half ago about in the payment space particularly around, they feel there hasn't been any innovation in Australia. Um, well, my question is specifically is, is how do you respond to that? And does it just not matter that there hasn't been innovation? Um, well, in terms of payment systems, I think it's probably a fair comment. I mean, uh, CBA are out there at the moment, Spruiky, they've now got 24-7 banking, uh, etc. And they're the first major bank to have that functionality and good on them. That's a fantastic effort. We bought it in 25 years ago. <laughs> so the, 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 um, the RBA, I think, are right in saying that there hasn't been uh, a lot of innovation in the payment system, although I would hazard a guess that most people here would be reasonably happy with the um, functionality and access that they have to their bank accounts and, and where they can get money and what payments they can make, etc., etc. So sometimes it's hard to marry those two things together. I think, though, um, where the role of technology will make a difference, and, and it's, it's probably um, not at the front end in the connection with the community, but it's actually in the organisation itself and making it easier for you to do business with your customers and driving the innovation that you can get there, driving efficiency, driving the costs, um, etc. That is where I think there is going to be some significant contribution from the software side of things. Um, and we're certainly looking hard at that, um, you know, because the, the ability for your customer to do more with you easily is going to be very important going forward as well because it'll be very easy for them to swap if they don't have the service that they need. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in uh, thanking Mike Hurst for his time tonight. Pick a card from this enormous bowl. As uh, the kind folk at Rance have uh, put forward a fantastic door prize for tonight. Sorry. One on top, but I saw what I got from. Sue Scully from SAS. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, that wasn't probably old enough. <laughs> So that's a, a smart box unique escape from the uh, the con people at Randstad, so thank you for that. Here you are. Thank you very much. Oh, pleasure. Thank you. Now our next leader's, thank you, Mike. Our next leader's lecture is um, on the uh, 30th of August. It's with um, the CFO of Westpac, Philip Coffey. So it's in Sydney, so um, do join our mailing list should you, uh, should you want to come along to that. And we've got a number of other ones throughout the course of the year that we've been scrolling behind you. Now, our fine facilities, the, the food and the beverages have been made possible from Alan's tonight. And to, uh, to say the last word, I'd like to invite uh, Richard Spurio, a partner at Alan's, to, uh, to, to close things off. Richard. Thank you. Um, I uh, always enjoy having the last word, but very rarely get it at home. But anyway, um, <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all for attending. It's been our pleasure to uh, support AAB and F and host this at our new premises, which I hope everyone has enjoyed. I think we'll all agree that Mike has uh, provided a very interesting and thought-provoking talk tonight. I think the insights into technology and the community basis and the community sort of, uh, vision of uh, Bendigo Bank um, is very uh, interesting for people to hear about. It was a very entertaining talk and, and only three or four references Geelong. I think we all got off pretty lightly. <laughs> uh, but I think it's also for an organisation like Bendigo to actually um, not just talk to talk, but walk to walk. I mean, that community model does have real results, and I'm very proud of Alan's involvement in that model, but also, I think, to have a survey of results that Mike talked earlier about 96 and 77 sort of percent uh, rates within, within um, a, 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 any organisation, I think, is fantastic. Um, I took a snap survey of the two Alan's employees who were standing next to me, and I got a 100% strike rate, but that's <laughs> perhaps not indicative of our model. But I think that is a, that's terrific and says a lot about the organisation. So, uh, another, perhaps another round of applause for Mike. For, 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 for. everyone and um, I think we'll have a few more drinks and put the footy on hopefully. No, <laughs>